we're going to take a look at the idea of command injections, which is essentially a way of being able to inject um, code into a web application. And it's relatively similar to other types of injection type vulnerabilities, things like SQL injections and that sort of thing. The general idea of it is the same, that we're going to input something that gets interpreted as code, or in this case, as a command, and then it will execute against the server. And the idea is that by doing this, we're able to execute any system command against the server with the same privileges of the um, the user that runs the web application, which means that we can either expose information about the server or potentially upload things to the server or get re um, reverse shells. And typically reverse shell would be the, the goal of doing an attack like this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over the basics of how this sort of attack works and give you a general idea of what exactly you're able to do with it. So just for a little bit of context, I have this, um, this Linux virtual machine that's running. And this is what I'm using as my server. So when I log on to this, um, essentially I've got like this index.php file. Uh, it's a rather simple file. Uh, let's go ahead and cat it. Essentially what it does is when we get a post request, it takes in the, um, the IP that's provided and then it's gonna go ahead and it's going to execute the shell command to ping the IP that's provided twice, and then it will echo out the output from that. So the idea is if we can insert something into this ping command to get it to execute along with the ping, so to do the ping and then sort of do something else, that would be the way that we would be able to get a command injection to actually happen. So to understand exactly what's gonna happen, you should understand a little bit about how um, Linux handles commands, right? So when we run the ping command, so if I do like ping hyphen C two of my, my local IP, for instance, um, hyphen C is count. So it'll say that it will ping the IP twice. So you see it pings twice, and then it gives you sort of like a summary of the actual ping itself. Using a lot of different methods, we can actually concatenate commands together so that they run like two at a time. So one of those in Linux is a semicolon. A semicolon essentially tells it, okay, there's the first command, and then here's a second command. And we could do something like cat um, etc slash password is a typical one that you would do. What this will do is it will expose the content of the, of the password file, which contains all the users that are on the system. So you see when this happens, it will do the ping, and then it does the second command afterwards, which would be exposing the contents of that password file. So this is one way that we are able to concatenate commands together. And there's a few different ways that we can do this. Um, and they're all just different characters that separate. So um, another one that we have is these two ampersands. And it gives you a similar sort of output. Uh, it's equivalent of doing essentially an and. So with the first one, we were saying like, uh, run the first command and then run the second command. This one we're saying, run the first command and also run the second command. So this will allow us to concatenate the commands together as well. This one is particularly helpful if they happen to, um, you know, censor the semicolon parameter. Um, for instance, like if you enter in an IP, it's typically like a numeric value with periods only. So um, if you were to try to protect from this, you could do a regular expression to take in only digits that have like periods or that sort of thing. Um, and in some cases, you might be able to, um, to sort of sneak some other characters in um, using like the ampersands or some of the other characters that will go over here. Uh, so understanding different types of uh, ways to concatenate commands together is beneficial to be able to attack different systems. So those ampersands is a very common one. Um, the single pipe is one that's very common as well. With this one, this, this is the pipe command. So what it does is it takes the input from one command and uses it for the next command that follows. So it takes the result of the ping and uses that as the input for cat. Cat doesn't take any sort of input, so that just outputs everything to the screen. And then the final one is or, which is two pipes. This one is a little bit more tricky. You'll see if I do it normally, it just pings the server and it doesn't execute our second command. The reason that this happens is because the or command will only execute the second command if the first command fails. So if we put in like a letter, for instance, the first command fails, so the second command executes. So those are the four common types of uh, ways of concatenating commands together. So when you're taking a look at the input from the server, we essentially, we have control over the IP address and we can write in a command that will have an IP address that's valid. 
and then we can write in one of those special characters and then the next command that we want to execute. So for instance, I could do that same sort of idea and then we could do cat um, etc password. So you can see here that we essentially give it that same input. We give it the IP and then a semicolon and then we give it the next command. When we execute this, you'll see it does the result of the ping and then it also cats the password file. So you can see that this allows us to expose the data. And just to show to you that all of them will work in this case, um, we can do, for instance, the two ampersands. Um, so that will work, for instance. Um, and we could do it with all of them, right? So we can do it with the pipes, we can do it with the with the or command. So all of those will work for this sort of instance. Um, so you can see that each of these commands will allow a command, ex a, a command execution to be completed. Now, as I was saying before, we wanna know those different types of characters that work because they may be trying to filter specific ones out. In reality, if you're running a system command from a web application, it's actually very hard to actually adequately filter out all of the different types of injections that can happen. So typically, like the guidance on this is to try not to use system commands whenever possible. Um, if a server has a system command like this, like this sort of like ping feature, for instance, it tends to be relatively easy to be able to find something that will allow us to, to execute an arbitrary command. And again, just by trying those different types of um, parameters is how you're gonna be able to find those pieces of information. Now, there are a few other things to keep in mind here. If the server is running on Windows, you have to slightly modify the payload a bit. So for instance, if you're on a Windows computer and you're using your command line, you see ls doesn't work, right? But there does, for instance. So there's a different set of commands for Windows versus um, Linux. So you have to be sort of, sort of aware of that. As well with Windows, some of the different commands won't work. So I don't think the semicolon one works, but typically like the two ampersands together is a really good one because it works on both systems. So uh, that's another thing to just sort of keep in mind with that, that um, if you're working with a Windows server, you have to use slightly different commands. And the slightly different command is gonna be using the, um, the ampersands. And then like, um, I'm not sure about actually catting files. Um, there are other commands, of course, that you can try, like things like dir, for instance, will expose the directory if it works. Um, as long as you get one of these to work, then you can just sort of like look up whatever command you want afterwards, right? So um, a lot of the times people will be like, you know, how, how can I get a reverse shell out of something like this? And the answer is you really just have to like run like a shell command or something like that. Or you can utilize this to expose the like hashed passwords and then do like an offline password attack to be able to brute force the passwords. Um, but yeah, for instance, like if you're able to get things like shell or something like that, or you could potentially like install malware through it to give you that reverse shell. Um, so the, the ability to do that is relatively endless, right? You can, you can do really whatever you want out of this. Um, as long as you have access to the command injection, you can literally inject any sort of command in. So this vulnerability is extremely critical. If it ever exists on a server, it's typically scored at its CVSS 10 out of 10. It's extremely critical because um, if someone is able to execute commands on your system, they can do literally anything, um, assuming that they have the proper permissions, right? But from being on the server and being able to execute commands, you can easily escalate permissions, um, either through compromising one of the files through catting like the password or shadow files, or by you know uploading a piece of malware or some payload to it. Um, if you want a little bit more detail on uploading payloads as well, um, I can give a little bit of insight on this too. The idea with this is going to be when we have um, essentially like this, this ability to um, run commands on the server, uh, one of the things that we would be able to do is create a user. For instance, we could do like user add to add a user onto the server. And what you can do is you can add a server or add a user to the server who you could then like use something like win SCP to like SSH into or to FTP into or SFTP into or whatever you really want to do. Um, in addition, you can also like enable FTP or you can enable SSH. Um, and then using that, you can essentially go onto the server and upload whatever you want onto it. And then using this command injection, you can sort of navigate to where you want to go and execute your payload from there. Um, 
In addition, you could also like upload like PHP files or um, you know HTML files or really anything that you really want to be able to do that. So a lot of time like website defacement can be done using this just by uploading different files or modifying different files. So the possibilities with this sort of attack are really large, right? You could do a lot of things with this, but this gives you the general idea of how to sort of prove that a command injection exists. And so the different ways that you can do that on a system that isn't doing any sort of filtering or anything like that. So using this, you should be able to, um, if you have like a, an input where you have control over a command, you should be able to try out some different inputs to determine if that system is vulnerable to this sort of attack or not.